أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد Welcome to another episode of our Tafsir page by page in which inshallah ta'ala we're going to go through each and every single page of the Quran a page at a time making its tafsir. By currently on the page that begins with verse number 17 and the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning the category of the hypocrites that we began in the last episode and that is that Allah Azza wa gives a number of descriptions concerning them and their attributes. In verse number 17 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets forth a parable, a parable concerning the hypocrites and Allah Azza wa says أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم مثلهم كمثل الذي استوقد نارا فلما أضاءت ما حوله ذهب الله بنورهم وتركهم في ظلمات لا يبصرون They are like people who labor to kindle a fire When it lights up everything around them Allah Azza wa Jal takes away their light leaving them in utter darkness unable to see This is the example of the people of hypocrisy Imagine a person who is in the middle of a desert they have no uh, nothing that they took with them in preparation for being in the middle of the desert. They just got stuck there by no fault or by no uh, means of their own. They're in the middle of the desert and it's extremely dark. They have nothing to light a fire with. They have nothing to protect themselves from the bitter cold of the night of the desert. And so they are completely unprepared. And all of a sudden they find a fire that is already lit. A fire that provides them with light that allows them to see their surroundings, that gives them a measure of safety and security, that allows them to feel at ease, and it is also a fire that gives to them warmth, so that they can take from that fire and benefit from it. They can take from the fire in terms of cooking from that fire, and taking warmth from the fire, and allowing themselves to be able to see in their surroundings. And then, without any warning, the light is taken away from the fire. Allah Azza wa says the light will be removed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away their light. So the heat of the fire or the burning quality of the fire is still there. But a fire that you cannot see that is raging with heat that cannot be seen is extremely dangerous because you don't know how far you can go and how close you can go to it. You don't know if that fire is spreading and coming towards you or if it is not moving towards you. And so the people are left in pitch darkness in a fire that is burning them, or about to burn them, or is going to consume them. And they are in the darkness of the night, with the darkness of the clouds, with the darkness of the surroundings that they are left in. This is the example that Allah Azza wa Jal gives of the, of the people of hypocrisy. Because the people of hypocrisy didn't have iman, didn't know the meaning of la ilaha illallah, didn't, have, didn't know who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to them in the city of Medina, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they saw the benefits of Iman. They saw the lights of Iman in Medina. They saw Salah and they saw fasting and they saw Zakah and they saw all of the other benefits. They benefited by being in the, you know, even if it was only outwardly, by being in the group of the Muslims. They benefited from the wealth that came to the Muslims and the power and the prestige that the Muslims had by Allah's permission at the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then that light was taken away or will be taken away from them when death comes and they will be left in utter darkness. Darkness of the, of the darkness of their sins, the darkness of their disbelief, the darkness of the hypocrisy and the darkness of the grave and its punishment and the darkness of the fire that they will remain in thereafter. That is the example and the parable that Allah Azza wa sets for hypocrisy, that Allah has given to them all of the things that should have given to them guidance. They saw guidance, they heard guidance, they were surrounded by guidance, but they didn't benefit from it. So a person who doesn't benefit from the light of the fire and doesn't benefit from the other elements of the fire that people can benefit from, such as cooking, such as seeing guide and taking a guide from the light of the fire and warmth and so on, then those people only deserve to be burned by it. 
And that is what Allah Azzawajal says concerning the people of disbelief. And that is because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, as He goes on to describe them in verse number 18, that the hypocrites are, Summum bukmun umyum fahum la yarji'un. They are deaf, dumb, and blind. They will never return, meaning to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and, and find His guidance. This is not literally, but figuratively speaking. They are not literally dumb, deaf, and blind, but figuratively they are deaf. So they don't understand guidance. They can't hear guidance and that guidance doesn't settle within their hearts through their hearing. They are dumb, meaning that they can't speak what is good. Remembrance of Allah Azza wa recitation of the Quran, dua, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are umi, they are blind to seeing the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are all around them. Signs that they see of guidance, signs that they see of revelation, signs that they see in the universe and the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone is figuratively speaking, therefore, deaf, dumb, and blind, فَهُمْ لَا يرجعون. Such people will never be able to find guidance. Such people will never come closer or come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa then gives another parable, another example of the people of hypocrisy. And he says in verse number 19, يَجْعَلُونَ أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ مِنَ الصَّوَاعِقِ حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ or like a people who are under a cloudburst from the sky, with its darkness, thunder and lightning. They put their fingers into their ears to keep out the thunder claps for fear of death. Indeed, Allah surrounds the disbelievers. Allah Azza wa gives another example. A person who's walking down the road or outside, and all of a sudden the dark rain clouds come upon them. Even during the day, if dark rain clouds come, they bring with them darkness in the sky. They cover the, the sky with their darkness. So you have the darkness of the sky and the darkness of the clouds. And then you have the darkness of the rain that descends from that cloud. And then you have the storm with its thunder and its lightning that frighten people. You don't know how close that lightning strike is going to come. You have that constant fear that maybe that lightning will strike you and will burn you and will harm you. This, these are the people, these are like the people of hypocrisy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says concerning them, they place their fingers into their ears out of fear. They don't want to hear the loudness of the thunderclap. They don't want to see or they don't want to have the, uh, you know, the, the, the lightning snatch away their eyesight. And they fear death at that time or they fear harm at that particular time. Allah azza wa says in verse number 20, يَكَادُ الْبَرْقُ يَخْطَفُ أَبْصَارَهُمْ The lightning almost snatches away their sight. كُلَّمَا أَضَاءَ لَهُمْ مَشَوْ فِيهِ وَإِذَا أَظْلَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَامُوا Whenever it flashes on them, they walk on, and when darkness falls around them, they stand still. These are the people that Allah Azza wa gives the example of the people of hypocrisy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing them when it comes to their, the way that they deal with the book of Allah Azza wa and the Qur'an, and they're hearing the Qur'an, and they're listening to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa gave to them the Qur'an. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gave to them within the Qur'an guidance. He gave to them commands and prohibitions and teachings and mercy and blessings within his book, Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. This is like the example of a person who's walking and they're going to find signs that are clear around them, as clear as the thunder and lightning. Because the thunder and lightning, because of how loud they are, because of how vivid they are, the lightning and its, and its power, and the thunder in its sound, the lightning in its light, and the thunder in its sound, how vivid and clear they are. This is the example that Allah Azza wa gives of the guidance of the Quran. The guidance of the Quran is so clear in its signs, so clear in its message, so clear in its stories, in the commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned therein. These people are there and they see everything within the Quran because they heard the recitation of the Quran. They heard in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself reciting the Quran, the companions and the believers reciting the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Maybe they themselves even recited portions of the Quran, but what do they do with the book of Allah Azza wa Jal? They treat it like they would treat that thunder and lightning. They place their fingers in their ears out of fear that some of it should settle in their heart. They don't listen to it. They don't want to know it. And this is exactly what the Quraysh used to say to the people of Mecca and the visitors that used to come in Mecca in the early days of the message of the Prophet ﷺ. They would say to them, beware, don't listen to this man. He's a sorcerer, he's a magician, he's a poet, he's crazy, he's a madman. If you listen to his words, that magic would influence you. 
if you listen to his words his fortune telling and his and his his his, his sorcery will impact your heart and it will make you leave your gods and your forefathers and their religion and it will make you follow his way instead so the Arabs would generally walk across the Prophet وسلم, with their fingers in their ears lest that they should hear the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would sometimes go and they would place wool within their ears and there are stories of this that you will find in the seerah of very intelligent, uh, literate, very eloquent leaders of different Arab tribes coming to Mecca to perform pilgrimage or they're there on some business and trade and the Meccans would say to them beware today or in these times we have a crazy man amongst us we have a sorcerer amongst us we have a poet a madman amongst us so if you're going to walk around the Kaaba and around the streets of Mecca take some cotton place it in your ears and then walk because if some of his words fall within your heart or they come into your into your hearing then you will perhaps leave the religion of your forefathers and follow his way instead. And so you would find those people doing that. Why then, uh, you know, this is, uh, why then are such people entitled to seek guidance if this is the way that they are? Those people who are intelligent enough amongst those Arabs, they would realize the foolishness of this. And they would realize that if someone is so powerful in their speech, so powerful in the message that they're giving, then most likely it's not going to be sorcery or the ramblings of a madman or some poetry when the Arabs were the premier tribes or premier people who were most literate of, you know, most literate when it came to Arabic poetry and Arabic literature. And so they would ignore what the Meccans said. But those people who were foolish enough to accept what the Meccans said, they would walk around with their fingers in their ears or with cotton wool within their ears. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives exactly the same example here. This is how the, the, the hypocrites treated the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, walking around with their fingers in their ears lest they should hear it. Khashyat al maut they fear death. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, as we mentioned in verse number 19, Hadar al maut they fear death. As if this would come and it would harm them, meaning the message of the Quran and the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, <coughs> وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَذَهَبَ بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ And if Allah had willed, He could have taken away their hearing and their sight, meaning their actual hearing and their actual sight. It's a warning to say that if Allah wanted to punish these people in this world, He could have made them deaf, He could have made them blind. And indeed Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Indeed Allah has power over everything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do so. Because Allah Azza wa wants people to seek guidance, wants people, wants people to receive guidance. Allah Azza wa wants people to use the senses and the skills and the different talents that Allah Azza wa has given to them, his blessings. He wants them to use them in a way that will bring them closer to him and of iman in him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is the example that Allah Azza wa gives in the parable that is set forth for the hypocrites. In verse number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives to us after this description of these three categories that we've been speaking about the believers the disbelievers and the hypocrites allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives to us the first commandment of the quran the first order and the first commandment of the quran is found in verse number 21 in surah al-baqarah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhan nas o mankind o people meaning that this is a directive a command for all of humankind for all people it's not just for the Muslims, it's not just for the Arabs, it's not just for the Quraysh of Mecca or the family and tribes people of the Prophet ﷺ. It is something for all of mankind. What is that directive? What is that command? Worship your Lord who created you and created those who came before you that you may attain taqwa. Allah gives to us the first directive in the Quran. And that is that everyone should worship Allah, the one who created everyone and everything. Surely the one who created the universe and everything within it has the right to be worshipped as the creator and lord of that universe subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah Azza wa Jal says elsewhere in the Quran, in Surah Al-Dhariyat, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have only created the jinn and the humans that they should worship me alone. So Allah Azza wa Jal gives this first command of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you have the Qur'an with all of its guidance. There are three types of people when it comes to the Qur'an. Those people who will believe, who will use the Qur'an as a source of guidance, who will use the Qur'an to believe in what Allah has revealed and come closer to Him by their belief and through their actions. 
And then you have a category of people who disbelieve, who turn away, who have no interest, who have sealed their senses from receiving that guidance. And then there is the category of people who are also disbelievers, but they are hypocritical in nature. They show one thing and they hide another. What they show internally or what they conceal internally is different to that which they show externally. And they are dangerous because of this very fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says commanding all of those groups, all of those people, O you who believe, meaning all, O mankind rather, O people, worship your Lord. Why should you worship Allah azza wa jal? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to us a number of reasons. The first of those reasons, because he's the one who created you. He created you and he created those before you. Your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, everyone who came before you all the way down to our father Adam alayhi salatu was salam. But not just humans, angels, jinn, every single type of creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of it subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ If you want to achieve a sense of piety, a level of God consciousness, a level of coming closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, and at the same time being safeguarded and saved from His punishment subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the path to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then in verse number 22, He gives us further reasons why He is deserving of being worshipped alone. And see how Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned to us the signs that Allah Azza wa Jal gives that the hypocrites are people who see the signs of Allah and they ignore them. They see the signs of Allah that, is, that are as clear as a lightning strike or the thunder clap and they still ignore it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, these are some of the signs that I have given to you. In verse number 22, Allah azza wa jal says, He is the one who spread out the earth for you. The earth and its spreading is one of the greatest signs of Allah azza wa jal. <coughs> it is repeated numerous times in the Quran as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The earth is spread out. Even though we know that we live on the earth and that the earth is round, but the way that we reside upon it is, is as if it has been spread out and it is flat. Meaning that when you walk from one side of your land to the other side, or if you were to walk from one continent, from one side of a continent to the other side of, con of the continent, even though the, 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 the earth is spherical in nature or in reality, the way that you walk is as if it is flat and spread out. You don't ever go to a part of the earth where you think you're going to fall off the edge, that you're coming to the end, that you're coming to a precipice and there's nothing there for you. The earth is spread out with its mountains and its rivers and its oceans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread out the earth in such a way that you can live upon it, reside upon it, travel upon it, uh, use it in terms of your vegetation and your crops and your livestock and the animals that you eat from and graze and so on and so forth. Everything you can use when it comes to the earth, Allah Azza wa Jal has made it flat and spread out for that exact purpose. And Allah Azza wa Jal built for you the sky above you with all of its beauty and everything that it contains of clouds, of stars, of the sun and the moon, everything that you see in the heavens from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sun that gives you the ability to live and reside through its rays, through its light, through the warmth and the heat that it provides, the moon with what it does in terms of providing light at the night and guidance and you measure your worship and your actions through moon sighting and through the phases of the moon, the stars that people use as lamps and they use as guides and as landmarks and by knowing the way of how to navigate through the earth and upon upon the sea, Allah Azza wa Jalla has placed all of that upon the uh, in the heavens. And Allah Azza wa Jalla then continues and says, "Wa anzala min al-sama'imaa," and then Allah Azza wa Jalla caused water to pour forth from that very sky. The clouds when they form and the rain that is given, which is the life of the earth that comes and as a result of it Allah Azza wa Jal says فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ that with that water they produce he produced for you things for your sustenance so you use the water to drink from but you use that rain water also for all of your crops and for everything that you grow and Allah Azza wa Jal then allowed you to grow from it fruit and vegetation and plantation and herbage and all of those things that you use to survive and to live upon 
isn't the beauty of the earth in its greenery isn't the beauty of the earth whichever part of the world that you live in when the rain descends and people benefit from it and the animals that benefit from it even in the desert the life of that desert comes in the rainy season where those animals and the people living there will find some respite and find for them self some sustenance that Allah has given to them as a result of that so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So do not knowing this, set up rivals besides Allah Azza wa in worship. If this is the case, that Allah created you, and Allah created everything that came before you, and Allah Azza wa created the universe around you, then therefore He has the right to be worshipped alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah Azza wa gives the directive of worshipping Him alone, and at the, end, at the end of verse number 22, the prohibition of worshipping anything besides him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is essentially what Tawheed is. For the believer, Tawheed is affirmation and negation. To negate worship from everything besides Allah, to affirm it for Allah Azza wa Jal alone. That is the meaning of La ilaha illallah. La ilaha, none has the right to be worshipped. Negated from everything. Whether that person is human, or whether that is a creature, or whether that is an angel or a human or a prophet or a messenger, whether it's some type of creation such as the sun or the moon, or any, it is negated from everything. Illallah. And then we affirm it only from Allah Azza wa alone. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verses 21 uh, and 22, Allah Azza wa gives that directive, worship Allah Azza wa alone. And stay away from worshipping or anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the signs and the reasons that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions. And if you do so, you will achieve taqwa. You will achieve that state of piety and safeguarding uh, and safety. You will become from the people of taqwa if you worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone and obey Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from every type of shirk. And by doing so, then Allah Azza wa Jal saves you from His punishment. And so the meaning of taqwa is that you increase in piety, you increase in closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal, you increase in your consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every time and in every place. And the meaning of taqwa also is that then as a result of that, Allah Azza wa Jal pro- pro- uh, pro- protects you and safeguards you from his punishment subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the last two verses on this particular page, Allah Azza wa Jal then goes on to say, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ In verse number 23, if you have doubts about the revelation we have sent down to our servant, meaning the Prophet wasallam, then produce a single surah like it. Enlist whatever supporters you have besides Allah if you truly think that you can. Allah after giving that directive of worshipping Him alone, shows to us that the path to understanding how to worship him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the revelation that he received of the Quran. And verse 23 and 24 will speak about the sign of the book of Allah azza wa jal and the truthfulness of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam brought. And from those signs is this challenge that Allah azza wa jal gave. And that is that this man amongst you, speaking to the Quraysh of that time, this man amongst you, meaning the Prophet wasallam, is a man who was born amongst you. He is known to you. His family is known to you. He grew up amongst you. You saw his traits, his characteristics, his attributes. You know his character. You know his truthfulness. You know his honesty and his integrity. And now he's come to you and he said that he has a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that message is one that only calls to good. He tells you to be kind and to be generous and to be forgiving. He tells you to help the poor and the needy and those who are oppressed. He tells you to worship Allah Azza wa alone and not to worship gods that you created yourselves besides Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. It commands and calls to every good and it takes you away and prevents you from everything which is evil. So if you have any doubt concerning this man and therefore this shows the difference between the people who have doubt and those people that we spoke about a couple of episodes ago that Allah Azza wa said are the categories of the disbelievers whose hearts are sealed. Those people have gone so far that they have no doubt anymore. They just entrenched in their disbelief. But if you have doubt, if you're unsure, if you don't know and you question, you have questions concerning this revelation, then bring something like it. Bring a single surah, a single chapter like it. And we know that the shortest surah of the Qur'an is three verses. Surah Al-Kawthar, Surah Al-Asr, Surah Al-Fatih. This is the shortest surah that you will have in the Qur'an. Bring three verses like it. 
These verses are a challenge that Allah Azza wa gave to the people of Quraysh and the Arabs in general, who were extremely eloquent and were masters of poetry and Arab literature. And they used to say that the Prophet ﷺ, because it was well known that he was an unlettered, unread man, illiterate in his own way وسلم, he couldn't read or write, let alone be one of the most prolific uh, you know, literalists and, and uh, one of the most prolific scholars of literature and poets amongst the Arabs. So Allah says that if you think that this man is, is fake, if this man is a sorcerer, if this man is a poet, or whatever else it may be, then bring even three verses similar to it. And this is the second of the three stages in this challenge that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran. The first of them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we'll come onto this in Surah Al-Isra. Allah Azza wa Jal told the Quraysh to bring and the Arabs to bring a Quran like the Quran. Bring a book like this book. And then Allah Azza wa Jal made it easy and he said to them, bring 10 surahs in Surah Hud. Allah says, bring 10 chapters like the Quran. You don't have to bring 114. Bring 10 chapters, any size. Three verses is the minimum. So 30 verses. And then now Allah Azza wa Jal says in this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, bring a single verse. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِ Just one single surah, a uh, single surah of three verses, like the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, and bring whoever you want to help you. It doesn't have to be a single endeavor, a single person doing this. You can call all of the help that you need besides Allah Azza wa Jal, as many people, as many helpers, to bring a Quran like this. And don't think for one moment that the Arabs didn't try. Don't think that the Quraysh, and the other Arab tribes of the whole Arabian Peninsula did not try amongst themselves to bring something similar to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they were unable to do so. And that is why Allah says in verse number 24, تفعلوا And if you cannot do this, and you will never be able to do this, Then beware of the fire that has been prepared for the disbelievers whose fuel is men and stones, it has been prepared for the disbelievers. Allah Azza wa says, you cannot do this. The Arabs with all of their, of their scholars of literature and poetry, with all of their history of the poetry that they had in all of their tribes across the whole peninsula, were unable to bring anything like the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah Azza wa says that if you cannot do so, then know that the punishment of rejecting the signs of Allah of rejecting Islam, of rejecting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran is that Allah Azza wa has prepared for you a fire that will be your eternal punishment. It has been prepared for the disbelievers. Inshallah, we come to the end of this page today and inshallah, we begin the next page with the glad tidings that Allah Azza wa then gives to those people who do believe in the Quran and in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is the glad tidings of Jannah. May Allah Azza wa grant us all Jannah. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu ala bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.